thank you so much, Professor Miyagawa. It, thank you so much for inviting me here, and Dr. Morasi for, uh, for the warm welcome and time that we had in Kyoto as well. And it's a pleasure for me to be here today, and I want to begin by showing you what I look like when I'm getting ready to go to my job in Michigan in the United States. So this is me, I'm about to go to work, right? Now, I teach this online course, you might have heard of it, called Learning How to Learn. And my co-instructor in this course is a fellow named Terrence Sanowski. Now, Terry is the Francis Crick Professor at the Salk Institute. He's a legendary neuroscientist. And here is Terry going to work at his day job, right? So how do two such completely different people get together? It's actually the great new world of MOOC making, right? Online learning. So I teach something that, that course is called a MOOC, which stands in English for Massive Open Online Course. And the course itself is learning how to learn. And as Professor Miyagawa said, it's got, we've got about 2 million students now from over 200 countries around the world. And here's the interesting thing. So, so I was invited by Harvard to speak at Harvard. I was this nervous wreck, right? Because here I am, I'm just this little professor in a Midwestern university. So I go to Harvard, and it's a big room, right? I walk in the room, and it is packed, filled to bursting, all around the edges, standing room only. And I thought, what is it? Why is there so much interest in this one little course, right? And it turns out it's because learning how to learn, that one course made for less than $5,000 in a room, a side room of my house, actually had on the order of the same number of students as all of Harvard's MOOCs put together, made for millions of dollars with hundreds of people. So what this tells you is something very important. It tells you anybody can do it. But not everybody does it. So uh, the, the thing is that I think is very important is that Japan's own opportunities in MOOC making are immense. There are vast ways that you too can tap into this, this real interest and real way of helping other people. And so I'll try to give you a few little insights in the context of this presentation to help you understand what ways you can use to help people learn through online learning. So I should start by giving you a little bit of background about myself. So, so here's the thing. I grew up moving all over the United States. By the time I was about 15 years old, I'd lived in 10 different places. Now, the thing about math as a subject is math is very sequential. So if you fall off the, the, the subject matter anywhere along the line, you're lost. You can't catch up very easily. So when I was seven years old, I moved from Lubbock, Texas, all the way up to Chelmsford, Massachusetts. And I, there you go, I, they were way far ahead of me in the multiplication tables. So, seven years old, hey, you know, I just thought, I can't do this. Math is not for me. I'm not a math person, right? I must be, you know, kind of like, just more of a language person. So I flunked my way through elementary, middle, and high school math and science, which is kind of ironic, given that I'm standing here in front of you as a professor of engineering. <laughs> so one day, one of my students found out about my, my sordid, my bad past as a math flunky, and he asked me, how did you do it? How did you change your brain? 
And I thought about it. I thought, you know, how did I change my brain? Because here I was, I was this little girl, and I like to show this picture because it is the last cute picture of me, right? So, but I loved animals, and I liked knitting, and you know, kind of those kinds of things, nothing to do with math and science. So, so I thought, uh, there's one thing I'd like to do if I could, and I'm so envious of you, is I want to learn another language. I only spoke one language, English, right? I grew up in a resolutely monolingual household, and I thought, I want to learn another language. And so, there, I didn't have the money to go to college, so I thought, you know, there is one way that I can learn another language and actually get paid for it, and that is join the army. So, that's me about to throw a grenade, right? And I'm looking really, really nervous, because if you knew how clumsy I actually am, you'd know why I look so nervous, right? But I did learn another language. I learned Russian, and I ended up working out on Soviet trawlers up in the Bering Sea. And so when I have a little bit too much to drink, I, I, my Russian all comes back to me, right? So, but I just loved having adventures and seeing the world through new perspectives. So I also ended up working at the South Pole Station in Antarctica, and that's where I ended up meeting my husband, right? <laughs> so, and he's, he's actually here tonight. There he is. Uh, uh, so three cheers because uh, he's been invaluable in helping to make this learning available for everyone. So, so anyway, I, there was one thing that happened. When I, I, I was getting up, I was about 26 years old, and I was getting ready to get out of the service. And I suddenly realized something shocking, and that was, you know, recruiters were not knocking at the door saying, please, we want you to come to our job, because nobody was hiring Russian translators, right? There's very few jobs available. And I suddenly realized that what I'd done was I'd followed my passion to learn a new language, but I hadn't, I hadn't done anything more than that. I just like kept myself in a small box. So, so here I was, you know, 26, and I recalled that I'd worked with all these West Point military engineers when I was in the Army. And they had terrific career opportunities available. In fact, these people, they, they seem to be able to solve problems more effectively. And so I, I thought, you know, are they just born smarter? Or did they maybe learn it while they're learning engineering? And so looking at my limited career choices, and also at the idea that I was always supposed to be open to new perspectives and new adventures, I thought, why don't I try and see if I can change my brain? Go back and start again and actually see if I can learn math and science. And so, so I did. And it was really hard. But if I'd known then, what I know now about how to learn effectively, I could have made it much easier on myself. So one day, one of my students found out, or, or well, after he found out about my sordid past, he asked me um, sort of, how did you do it? And as I began trying to answer that question of how I did it, I thought, I should write a book. In fact, I began writing a book. I like to write, so I started writing away. And then when I got done with the writing, there's this website on English speaking, you know, uh, in this English speaking world, where you can see how good college professors are. It's called ratemyprofessors.com. And so I went to this website and I downloaded the top two to 300 professors uh, who, uh, as top teachers in subjects like 
uh, engineering, physics, chemistry, economics, psychology, English. And I got the emails of all of these professors, thousands of them, and I emailed them all. And I said, you know, I wrote this book about how to learn effectively. Would you look at my book? And shocking numbers, uh, uh, shocking percentages said yes. So I sent them my book and I got all this feedback and it was fantastic. But I learned something really interesting. A lot of these professors would write back to me and they'd say, you know, here's the thing, that your book is really good, but there's this one trick that I use when I'm teaching, but I don't like to mention it to other teachers. And that is, I use metaphor and analogy to convey the ideas. And what, as we now know from neuroscience, when you convey an idea, uh, like let's say the concept of the limit in calculus, if you can convey it through the mathematics, but if you convey it by maybe beginning saying, hey, you know, what if you have like a stalker who's getting closer and closer and closer, but never quite touching, you know, that person. That's kind of like the concept of a limit. And the neural pathways that arise because of this concept, you, you've, you've put that concept in while you implanted the metaphor, are the same neural circuits you use to actually understand the mathematical concept itself. So metaphor is indeed a very powerful teaching tool. But the, the professors didn't want to tell other professors that they use this tool. Why? Because they, they found that other professors gave them a bad time about it. They said, you're dumbing down the material instead of that you're more rapidly onboarding people onto the uh, material. So metaphor, as it turns out, truly is a powerful tool for learning. And many professors simply don't understand that. But so this shared secret handshake is something that I used in learning, right? The, the one that they didn't want people to really know because they were embarrassed about it. But it, it's been, it's a very, very effective tool. Now, as I was working on the book, I also reached out to top neuroscientists and top cognitive psychologists and top cognitive neuroscientists about what is going on when you really learn effectively. I put that all in the book. And I myself have taught for many, many years in STEM disciplines. So I, was, I wanted to put everything together in this book and in the MOOC. And what I'm going to share with you today is some of the best of what I found about how we learn effectively. Now the brain, as we know, is enormously complicated, but we can simplify its operation into two fundamentally different modes. The first I'll call focused mode. So focus mode is just what it sounds like. You, you focus intently, and you, you, uh, so hopefully you're focusing intently on this, and, and this kind of mode, the, the, it, it contrasts with this other mode called diffuse mode. And diffuse mode, oops, let's go back. Diffuse mode is more like relaxing. It's when you're not thinking about anything in particular at all. So maybe you're standing in a shower, going for a ride in a bus, or going for a walk. That's when you'll do diffuse mode. Now, to better understand some of these different ideas, we're going to use, what do you think? A metaphor, yes, okay. So the metaphor we're going to use is that of a pinball machine. Now, a pinball machine, if you're of a certain age, right, you will understand or remember how a pinball machine works. You just pull back on the plunger, and the ball goes boinking out and it bounces around on those rubber bumpers and that's how you get points. And what we're gonna do is we're going to take this pinball machine and we're gonna put it right into the human brain. So there you see, there's the, the nose above, there's the ears on the side. Okay, are you ready for it? Okay, okay. Here we go, pinball machine on the brain. Okay, so 
what this is, is this is an analogy for the focused mode. And see these rubber bumpers? They're very close together. Now, what happens in focus mode is you often have these patterns that have been laid. So, for example, if you know multiplication, you have patterns in your brain that, are relate, uh, that, that help you do multiplication when you need to. So if I ask you to multiply 22 times 33, the, your, your, your brain would move right along those patterns that have been previously laid. But what if you are learning something new that you've never encountered before? So let's say that you, you know multiplication, but you've never seen division before. What do you do? Well, division is kind of like a pattern somewhere else in your brain that you've never gotten to before. In fact, you, it's not even laid. You, you don't know what size or shape it is. So how do you even get to this new pattern called division? As it turns out, what you often do is you sit down to do division, you work in the part of your brain that you're familiar with already that does multiplication, and it doesn't work very well. So you get a little frustrated, and you get a little more frustrated. And then finally, you close the book in disgust, and you walk away, and guess what? When you do that, it opens a different part of the brain. It opens the diffuse mode. This diffuse mode is very different. Look at, see how close together those rubber bumpers are? Here, they're very far apart. And so when you think a thought, it moves along, but it can range much more widely before it encounters one of those rubber bumpers. This is really quite analogous to what's going on in the brain when you're in uh, the diffuse mode, right? You, you can, there are longer range connections in this mode. Now, you can only be in one mode at the same time. So you can either be in focus mode or you can be in diffuse mode, but not in both modes unless you are taking certain forms of mushrooms, and I'm not advocating that here. So, so anyway, but learning involves this back and forth between these two different modes. And this is, um, children often don't understand this. They will sit down, for example, this is what I did. I sat down, looked at math, said I don't get it right off the bat, so I must be stupid, I don't have a knack for nat math. And so they give up on it, right? Or they just don't focus their attention because they think it's, it's not really something they're very good at. If children, or adults for this matter, simply knew about these two different modes and that it's important to back away when they get stuck, they can learn more effectively because they, they don't keep trying to go on when they're really frustrated. They can walk around, they can study something different, and it makes their learning experience a, a lot happier one. Now, I just want to step back for a second here, and I want to give you a different way of looking at this. And that involves, how do we do this kind of thing on a MOOC? Uh, the, if you look here, this is me talking away, I hope. Oh, yeah. So, uh, so I cut the sound out so I can actually speak over me. Now notice how I'm, I'm standing there by my metaphor and, and pointing to it, and it makes it so much more real for students. I can turn around. It looks like I'm walking through the very metaphors that I'm trying to illustrate. And it, it's so easy to do this kind of thing. Do you know how I created these? Simple PowerPoint. That's all. So it's, it's so easy now to create these kinds of great learning experiences, and people absolutely love them. So, th so this is the kind of thing uh, that is possible. So hang on a sec, let me... Okay, you'll have to tolerate, I'll have to do that one or two more times coming up here, but they're pretty funny, so I think you'll like them, so... Uh, uh, but anyway, so here, there's a problem. 
When it comes to focused and diffuse modes, you know, it takes like some time to do that, right? Who has time? Especially if you like to procrastinate. <laughs> and as it turns out, procrastination is one of the biggest challenges worldwide that students have. Students will, they'll, they'll kind of put things off, they'll do it at the very last minute, and then they'll do a bad job, and they'll say, oh, you know, I'm just terrible at this subject, when actually they're not terrible at all. It's simply that they procrastinated. So, uh, was procrastination so important? I'm going to spend just a, a minute or two talking about it. As it turns out, when you even just think, just think about something you don't particularly like to do, it activates a portion of the brain that experiences pain. The brain, naturally enough, wants to stop that negative stimulation, and so it turns its attention to something else. So, what really happens is procrastination is kind of a habit. And so, it, at the beginning, you'll think about something you don't like, you get this kind of unhappy feeling, and then you turn your attention to something that's more pleasant, and the result is you feel happier almost instantly. Now, you've also just procrastinated. And so this is the challenge that students often face. Now, I could give a lot of great psychological explanations for why this happens, but I don't care, really. I just, we know a little bit about the neuroscience of why it happens. We want to jump right to what's the most effective way to handle procrastination, and that is using the Pomodoro technique. Now, this technique is so easy. It is, when we teach the MOOC, the Massive Open Online Course, it is one of the most incredibly popular techniques on the MOOC, aside from focused and diffuse and chunking, which we'll talk about a little later on here. But the Pomodoro Technique was invented by an, uh, uh, an Italian, Francesco Cirillo, in the 1980s, and, uh, and I just love it, and, and students love it. And all you have to do for this technique is, first of all, you turn off your cell phone. So no little ringy dingies, nothing to distract you. If you're on your computer, nothing else that will come up and you know pop up on the screen. Or in fact, that's a great productivity uh, tip overall: is reduce the number of pop-ups or anything that could disturb you in your work. So anyway. Once you've turned everything off that could you disturb you, set a timer for 25 minutes, and then just focus for 25 minutes. Anybody can focus for 25 minutes. Now, if you're like me, here's what I'll do. I'll sit down, set the timer. I'm doing a Pomodoro, right? So I work away, I work really hard, and then I look up at the timer, you know, because I've been working so hard, and I've just done two minutes of the Pomodoro. <laughs> and, and I go, my brain says, I just can't do this, right? I can't, do and, and I just let that thought go right on by, and I continue on working because the reality is we all get disturbed with our thinking. We all have monkey minds. At, but just keep on going because you can do the 25 minutes. And so, and here is actually the most important part is when you're done, you reward yourself. So listen to a favorite song, maybe uh, have a cup of coffee, go for a walk, talk to a friend, web, you know, surf the web a little bit, anything that will distract you from what you've been doing before. And this is important because for this reason. We always thought that you're only learning when you're focusing, but now you understand that part of your learning involves not focusing, just relaxing. And that's when your brain actually consolidates some of the ideas it's gotten and helps you to order them so you can call them to mind later. So a critically important part of the learning process is not consciously trying to learn anything. It, it's valuable. And the Pomodoro technique is kind of like a, a working meditation that brings out both of the important aspects focusing without distraction, and relaxing a little bit. So it's, it's one of the best techniques around. Now, if I give you a, one little tip, 
It's don't sit down thinking, I'm going to focus and I'm going to finish this entire set of homework, right? Uh, don't, don't think about finishing some big task. Instead, your whole goal is just to focus as intently as you can for 25 minutes. Whatever you get done, that's what you get done. If you focus on finishing something, that brings to mind that pain, and that's what you want to avoid. So that, in part, is, again, why this technique can be so effective. You're just working away for 25 minutes. Now, learning is a lot like being a great baker of cakes, right? People might come up to you and say, oh, you're a great baker of cakes. Well, can you tell us what's the most important thing in baking a cake? Well, there's no one important thing in baking a cake, you know, unless you're like a real total fan of icing, which I really like. So, but, but I mean, it, it depends on the flour, the 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 egg that you use, the temperature that you cook it at, even the pressure, right? How high are you in the mountains? Many different things go into baking a great cake, and similarly, many different things go into learning effectively. So what is one, uh, another important aspect of learning? It is, well, sleep. And I know what you're thinking, you're thinking, oh, well, I knew that already, right? But you probably don't know why sleep is important, and that will help you to make more effective use of sleep. Now, what happens when you're sleeping is this. So you have, these are my little analogies for neurons, these circles here. So when you're awake during the day, you have metabolic toxins that kind of emerge from the cells. And they drift around in your, in your brain, and they're what make you feel a little bit more muzzy and tired as the day goes by. Now, you might think, well, that's great. The metabolites go out into the cerebral fluid, where clearly it must get washed away. But it doesn't. And the reason is because, look, these neurons are, they're big. And so they, they are like big boulders that block the fluid from flowing by. But when you go to sleep, this is so cool. In fact, okay, so when you go to sleep, your brain cells shrink. So I love this, so I have to do it again, right? So there you go. So when you go to sleep, your brain cells shrink, and that allows the cerebral fluid to wash those toxins away. So that's part of why sleep is so incredibly important, is it helps to cleanse the brain so you're fresh. I've even seen doctoral students taking their qualifying exam with no sleep. I mean, it's crazy. They didn't do very well. So highly intelligent people, if they don't know why sleep is important, can still miss out on sleep just because they don't know it's important. Now, sleep is important, though, for another reason. And that is this. So if you look here, there's this fantastic new technique called light microscopy. And with light microscopy, you can go in and image living neurons. So this is a living neuron before learning and before sleep. And this is the exact same neuron after learning and after sleep. And you're thinking, wow, they grew these yellow triangles somehow. But <laughs> these yellow triangles are actually to indicate something that's small but very important. And that is where new neural connections, new synopses have formed. So sleep is important because that's where you grow the neural architecture of learning. So this is, in fact, why it's so important to space out your learning. Do a little every day. Because synopses, you can only grow so many synopses of an evening. If you practice a little bit every day, then what that can do is that, that creates a nice, solid pattern by the time you've been practicing for a while. But if you do everything cramming all at once, you get a very 
weak pattern because you haven't had days to build up a lot of neural uh, synapse connections with stronger connections. And this sort of built up um, pattern right here that you've crammed in one day is much easier for your sort of little metabolic vampires to suck away. So that's why sometimes students can, they can do kind of well by cramming at the beginning of a semester. And then as the semester goes by, they've been cramming and it worked, but their foundation was very weak. And so then they find they start doing worse and worse as the semester goes by and they've got this poor neural foundation. It's kind of like this. If you're building a good wall, then that wall has mortar and you let the mortar dry as you lay the brick layers. If you don't let that mortar dry, you just do it all at once, your brick wall looks kind of like that and it's a very poor foundation for learning. Now, there's, there's yet another aspect of learning that's very important and that relates to exercise. So exercise, if you look, this mouse is being taught to differentiate between those two patterns. This is an old study that was one of, it was the very first one that showed the importance of exercise in learning. And what they found was uh, this mouse, if it was allowed to exercise, actually did much better, could learn the patterns much more quickly. So if you look behind there, these are old synopses, or old neurons, sorry, and these are new neurons that have been born, and more of them are born if you exercise more. And we used to think that the brain is born with all the neurons it's ever going to have. You, you grow up, you get older, they die off, you get stupider, and then you die, and that was really a depressing way to look at the world, but fortunately, it was dead wrong. So now this exactly illustrates new neurons are being born every day in the hippocampus, which is a very important part for learning and for memory. And the more you, uh, uh, to a point, the more you exercise, the more the neurons are able to survive and thrive and grow and help you with your learning. So, Terry, the reason that I showed this particular very old study, because much more recent work has built on this incredibly important study, the reason I show it is, you probably can't read the name, but there you go, that fellow right there is Terence Sanowski, my co-instructor in the MOOC. So he was one of, one of the most, uh, one of the founders of, uh, of the field of uh, studying the importance of exercise in our ability to learn and remember. So when we were shooting the MOOC, we went out to San Diego, and uh, so I meet Terry, we're talking about all the stuff, and we're shooting stuff, so I can't help but ask him. I'm like, okay, so Terry, do you exercise? Terry's like, oh, do I exercise, right? So I had to show you. Let's show it just like this here. So there we go. This is Terry. And that's Terry running down the beach. And Terry does this like every other day or so. I love how this ends up. Watch this. It's like, yay, yes. So Terry exercises all the time. And I'm truly convinced that one of the reasons he's such a legendary neuroscientist is because he walks the walk. He takes this, this information that we get from research and he uses it in his everyday life and we can do that too. So, so let's, let's see, hang on just a sec. So, so I want to talk now, switch gears again just a little bit and I want to talk about working memory. So don't worry, we're not going to get into lots of stuff. For our purposes, there are two types of memory working memory, which is like what you can hold in short-term memory or long-term memory, stuff that you hold there for a long time. Now, we used to think that you have something like four slots, so to speak, of information that you could keep in your working memory. 
And so, you know, that, that, I mean, like for me, well, originally they used to think that we, we could hold seven slots, seven things in working memory, but now it's more like four. And those, are the, those four slots are in the prefrontal cortex. And what happens is you can kind of think of focusing as like this. It's like it has an octopus of attention that can reach through those slots of working memory and make connections into long-term memory. So if you think about like a little bit of music, you can reach into working memory and, and take that bit of, of music, maybe reach into another slot of memory and take another bit of music or a number or maybe a word in a foreign language. Those are all things that you can hold in working memory. Now, this is, to contrast this, we have, here is, um, this is diffuse mode. So focus mode, you've got an octopus of attention. Diffuse mode, you've got these sort of random tendrils that can go any way they want. So it's a very different process. Now, how do you, get something from working memory, that short-term memory, into long-term memory. As it turns out, practice kind of makes permanent. In other words, the more you practice with something, the bigger, deeper, and richer those kinds of patterns become. So if you look here, there's a, a pattern, and then the more you practice with it, the deeper and richer that pattern becomes. So this leads me to one of the most important parts of this talk, and that involves the idea of chunking. Chunking is extraordinarily important in education and in learning, but unfortunately, it hasn't been given the prominence that it needs. So I'll explain a little bit about what I mean by chunking. So if you look at something that you don't understand, like a puzzle, right? or a mathematical concept you don't understand, or maybe a, a phrase in a foreign language. You first look at it and you try to sort of figure out what's going on. That working memory is going a little bit crazy. So the, when you finally understand what that concept is and you've practiced with it, it's a little bit like, oh, the puzzle has come together. And more than that, your working memory has consolidated that pattern into one easy chunk, a ribbon, that it can pull easily into mind. So that, that when, you, when you've chunked the information, you've gone from this wacky, crazy prefrontal cortex all being very much occupied to hey, everything's simple, I can draw it right up into memory, and look, the other three slots of working memory are free. Now, sometimes students will come up to me and they'll say, you know, I, I did really bad on this test. It's because I don't take tests well. I actually am test phobic, right? I've got anxiety about taking tests. Well, Often what I'll hear from these individuals, their teammates, is they never study. So what's really happen, happening with many of these individuals is they, they haven't studied, they sit down to take a test, and for the first time, they're looking at the problem, their prefrontal cortex is going crazy, and they think it's test anxiety, <laughs> instead of their brain going, I have no idea what's going on. So, so what it, this is why it's important for, for us as educators to know how learning really takes place. Because when a student comes up to me and says, you know, I don't take tests well, I can begin asking them, what did you really do to study? And oftentimes, it's not what we think they do. Sometimes they'll say things like, I spent 10 hours yesterday studying. <laughs> Well, you're not supposed to be studying 10 hours the day before the test. You're supposed to be studying all the way along. So uh, I had one student who, who came up to me and said, you know, I'm watching your videos, but I just don't understand English very well, and so that's why I'm not doing very well in your class. Well, 
he spoke English just about as well as I did, right? So I, was, I knew there was something a little funny. So I asked him, in the videos, when I tell you to stop the video and actively work the problems, do you do that? No. <laughs> so there were other things going on in his learning because what good learning always, always involves is if you're developing expertise, you are developing solid neural chunks. So I'm going to do one last little thing. So I just have to show you. So bear with me here. Okay. Okay, I know what you're, you're, you're probably thinking, what the heck, who's that? <laughs> well, that's, a, that's our younger daughter. So we made the MOOC, the course, for very little money, like $5,000, so super cheap. How did we do it so cheaply? It's because whenever I needed like an actress for a bit part, I'd go to our daughters and I'd say, hey, will one of you help me out? So for this particular case, I went to our daughters. I said, I need somebody to model backing up a car really badly. So her younger daughter's like, mom, I got this one, right? I can do this. So what you're gonna see here, this is our younger daughter uh, about to back up our car. And let's see, is she going? Not quite yet. Come on. Okay, look at her little, she's like crazy, right? Oh, yeah, which way do I look? Which mirror do I look at? Do I look here? Do I look there? Oh, you know, and then she goes off in the ditch, right? So, um, so the important idea here is this. When you first sit down to learn to back up a car, it's crazy input. Your working memory is at that crazy part, right? And so you're, you, you're looking at the front mirror, you're looking at the side mirror, you don't know which way to look, and you're kind of making a lot of mistakes. But once you learn how to back up a car, it's so easy, you don't even really need to think. All you have to do is think, oh, I'm gonna back up my car. And you begin backing up your car, you're talking to your friends, maybe you're listening to the radio, it's easy because you've created one neural chunk. So learning in anything is like this. You create sort of, um, let me pull this back up here. So you can see what we've got is we have, see these patterns? This is like the chunk of backing up. This is the chunk of related to, maybe you've you, you learned uh, the chain rule in calculus. So this is a chunk that, that, that you can draw up when you're looking to do a certain technique with the chain rule in calculus. Or you're, you're looking to conjugate a verb in Spanish. You have chunks that are well-practiced patterns that you develop, and it's kind of like you have this library of chunks that help support your expertise. So this is part of why practice and repetition in building these kinds of chunks in a variety of circumstances can really help you with your learning. So one thing though that we often do is we think some of our very best traits are really bad. So what do I mean by this? Best traits are bad? So a perfect example is poor memory. I mean, we often think that having a poor memory is a bad thing, right? I am here to tell you that having a poor memory can be a very good thing. Now, here's why. We, when we, you know, those four slots of working memory. So some people have like a steel trap. They can hold things in their working memory. They got it, right? And other people are like, they've got those four things, they really got it, right? But then, you know, they get, kind of get distracted. Ooh, shiny, right? And they, you know, they, something falls out of their working memory, right? So they don't have a good one. But when, when something falls out of working memory, something else goes in. And that's how we are more creative. And indeed, research is showing there's a counter correlation. The more, the, the stronger your working memory, the harder it can be for you to be more creative. So if you're one of those kind that has a little bit of a bit of trouble holding things in your working memory, 
congratulations. It actually can mean that you are a more creative person. But there's another thing. Sometimes we are slow thinkers, right? Like I'll have my class, I'm teaching probability and statistics, right? I'm teaching, well, I'll ask some really complicated question that I've already worked out. I know what the answer is. Some student at the front of the class, I mean, first time he's ever seen it, and, and I ask a question, he's like, I know the answer, right? Right off the bat. It's like he's got this race car for a brain. Some of us, however, have more like a hiker brain, right? Race car brain gets to the answer really fast. A hiker brain can get there, but it's like a lot more slow. So think about the difference though in race car and hiker brains. Hiker brains get there really fast, but it's all kind of a blur. Now, the, the, I mean, the, the race car brain. The hiker brain, on the other hand, it gets there a lot slower, but it, it can reach out, it can touch the leaves on the trees, you smell the forest, you can hear the birds, you see the little rabbit trails. Completely different experience than the race car brain, and in some ways, much richer and deeper. So if, if, if you're a slower kind of thinker, there can be advantages for you. You can sometimes see things that the race car brain can't see. My hero in science, for example, is a fellow named Santiago Ramoni Cajal. And he won the Nobel Prize for his pioneering work in neuroscience. In fact, he's considered the father of modern neuroscience. What Ramoni Cajal said was this. He said, I'm no genius. And he, he was actually being true about that. Uh, he said, I, I am where I am because I was persistent, and because I was flexible in the face of data that told me I was wrong. He said, I've worked with many geniuses. And what happens with geniuses is they're so used to being right that they tend to jump to conclusions, and then when they're wrong, they don't have much experience changing their minds. So they're very inflexible. So once again, if you're a slower thinker, not a genius, you can sometimes see things that even the geniuses can't see, and you're not as likely to jump to conclusions. So just to kind of switch directions just a little bit, I'd, I'd like to talk about the importance of massive open online courses and, and qu online learning in general. Many individuals, for example, older individuals, are looking to learn in their lives, but it can be very difficult to you know, find a, a, go to a university, right? It, it can be a long ways or a lot of time to even get there, get into the classes and so forth. Online learning can make things, this is why cyber university is so important, is it, it's allowing for people to get to learning at many different stages in their lives. Now your tendency is to sometimes think, you know, online learning is just not as good as regular face-to-face -face learning. It just can't be. But I'll give you an example. And this is a video, but we'll actually kind of skip the video here. Um, so this is, this is our older daughter, right? So, uh, so I needed a volunteer for someone to look really dorky, like kind of stupid, putting on some earphones. So that's what this video is showing. So my daughter, my older daughter, she's always a good sport. She's like, mom, I'll look stupid for you and I'll put these earphones on in the MOOC. So I just, it was a very short little clip in the MOOC where, where she's demonstrating how to block out sounds so you can focus more intently when you're in focus mode. So she, at that time, was a medical school student. And she had a, a, she's in a class with 75, her 75 fellow students. And she, she goes into class one day, sits down with her other students, and they're being taught by a preeminent cardiologist in Southeast Michigan. And the cardiologist is teaching away, teaching, and he suddenly stops the class, points right at her, and says, you, 
or the girl in the mook, right? So he recognized her from the little clips in the mook. So what this tells you is that even brilliant and very highly distinguished professors are watching these kinds of online learning materials in order to learn, and we can do that as well. There's so much need now, especially to keep Japan in line with what's going on uh, with the competitive nature of technology in today's world. Online learning provides a way for working people to keep up to date in their learning. So they don't just learn at the university, walk away, and then how do they keep up in their learning? MOOCs provide a way to do that. But th it's important to kind of look at what's going on in the learning world. There's caged learners. So caged learners are like learners who are maybe 18 to 24 years old, right? Those are the ones who conventionally go to a university and take the, the classes. Most university professors are used to caged learners. So in fact, they, you, you think that that's the whole universe of learners. My, I, I publish books, right? I write books, I love books. And one of the things, when I did the book of mine for numbers, my editor kept telling me, don't just write it for students, because I'd write it for, you know, and if you're a student here, you know, college student, she'd say, no, 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 you must think much bigger. And so I'm like, okay, she's my editor, I better do what she says. And so I wrote it for a general audience, and you know what? She was exactly right. Because as it turns out, the people who are really interested in learning aren't just 18 to 24 year olds. They're like, well, actually, you know, from eight to 85, there's a huge audience of people who really want learning materials. And we can give them that because of what's available now through great online learning. Now, there's ways to do it, again, and there's ways not to do it. So you want to just kind of look at some of the great things that are out there, and that's the standard for, uh, for very good online learning. There is something that I call a bit of the international culture wars out there. So, for example, if you go look at China, China has great MOOCs about how do you learn Chinese or Chinese history. But if you look in Japan, all the there's a hunger worldwide for more information about what's going on, you know, from a Japanese professor, profession or, or perspective. And that's where, I mean, right now, there's very few MOOCs. Uh, the best ones are from University of Tokyo. And there's so much room to have MOOCs that people will love worldwide. And so, for example, if you could, you, what you can do is capitalize on that worldwide interest there is in all things Japanese. So you can not only just do science, everybody's doing science. You can do things like Zen Buddhism. People are very interested worldwide in Zen Buddhism. Or manga. People are really, I mean, a lot of people come to Japan because of manga. Japanese garden. Great, great movies, I mean, there's super uh, literature, musicians, history, Japanese language, education, and much more. Do you have so much potential ahead of you that it is extraordinary? And all I can say is Japan is extraordinary, and I can hardly wait to see what's to come. Thank you so much for your attention this evening. <laughs>